Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another Journey on the Fly, the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me again. I know that some of you listen on your ride to work, on your ride home, on your ride to your fishing, on your way back, and I want to say truly thank you. In the in in light of Thanksgiving being upon us, I really truly mean that. I may not have a massive listeners base, but I know that my listener base is pretty loyal. I get emails and texts and messages occasionally asking when the next podcast is coming out. And I really, truly appreciate that. As you all know, that have been listening for a while, and to any new listeners, I am a full service licensed and insured fly fishing guide in Pennsylvania and parts of Ohio. We really specialize on wild trout fishing. We try to hold true to being a very much an instructional environment. We strive to fill you with information on the trout anatomy, on the anatomy of the trout stream, on the aquatic insects, and how that all kind of accumulates together into the world of fly fishing, both the obstacles that we face and how we overcome them. There is an enriching uh, joy that comes in that day, and I don't just mean that as a way for me to to brag about um, my personality coming to the table. I mean that in my personal joy in experiencing you, the client. I love meeting new people. I love meeting everybody that I have so far. I truly believe that I have gained a lot of friends in my course of beginning this guide service. So thank you all, if you're listening, for being part of this journey. And thank any of you for passing my information on because it is tremendous in many, many, many ways. With that comes an announcement. I want to say this before we get into the meat of our uh, next kind of monologue here when I talk a little bit about kind of step two on steelhead fishing for the beginner. And maybe some of this information I I dose out here will be new information for somebody who's been doing it a while. But here's the announcement. So I am partnering with Farbanks Fly Fishing Company, who is Sage and uh, Reddington. And We will be all offering trips, fly fishing trips, literally all over the world. From Africa to California to Colorado, Greenland, New Zealand, Quebec, all kinds of different places. We are also looking at doing things. um, We actually will have them available from Christmas Island to Costa Rica, Guatemala, Mexico, Texas, (laughs) saltwater destinations of that sort. We will be able to offer species ex- uh, species specific destination trips. These are hosted trips, not necessarily guided trips for me, but I will be along and I will be there to help on, on many of these trips or I will send one of our other guides uh, along with both for their experience and to make sure that your experience is uh, as deep and as good as it possibly can be. I have not taken all these trips, obviously. I've taken literally none of these trips, but my connections to these to this world is, is um, I have a real trustful connection here. Um, so some of this will be a little bit new for me and you both, but it comes from a very trusted, reliable resource. That is why I'm even bringing it up over this microphone today. So look soon. Um, onto my website as we'll start to get these things up and available for bookings. And I'm excited to do this with you. I'm excited to offer this to you. These are world-class fishing destinations. The only thing that you will have to do yourself at all will be to get yourself there from airfare and the gratuity for your guides and the services rendered to you by those folks there. So that's some good news. That's some exciting news for me. That's uh, a little scary news, to be completely honest for me, because that's another part of this. And I want my career, my vocation to be in the world of fly fishing. And this is one more step in that journey. 
for me. So I thank you for joining me. And if you're interested in any of those places that I've already mentioned, get a hold of me right away. Or if you know people, we can start this process because, listen, I love fishing for steelhead in the winter as much as the next grunt fly fisher person does. But wouldn't it be wonderful to be in some beautiful sunny, getting a tan while you're fly fishing while everybody else is back here freezing their butts off? <laughs> of course it would. All right, let's get into, we started this uh, this journey here just recently where we're going to do some multiple episodes, and this is going to be number two, and really the, a concise means to help the beginner in steelhead fly fishing. Now, gear fishermen can learn a little bit about all this stuff, but in reality, it's not directly applicable in many instances. I mean, some of the general data is helpful. And um, to me, I'm a, I'm a data guy. I'm a guy that loves knowledge because to me, like fly fishing, the more you know about it, the more you, um, the more you encounter fly fishing and knowledge, the more humble you become. Because the more I learn, the more I learn, I have to learn more. Or as I say otherwise, uh, the more knowledge that I gain, that knowledge humbles me to make me realize that I didn't know what I thought I did. And there's much more out there to be learned. And I love that. Personally, that's a freeing thing to me because I know that, one, I, I can't ever be a know-it-all. And two, if I run into somebody who thinks they're a know-it-all, well, my ears automatically go closed. They just do. Because for somebody to think that they've got it all figured out is somebody that's just too arrogant for me to be around, to be honest. And for somebody who doesn't choose to gather knowledge on a regular basis is really just another person I just don't want to hang out with because that person makes themselves the arbiter of truth and the resource of all knowledge. And sorry, just ain't somebody that quite smart with feet on this planet at the moment. So that's just my views on those kinds of things. But let's dive into this. I want to talk to you today kind of what are steelhead? What, where do they come from in a sense? And, and, and what does the world of, of the steelhead itself look like? Because it's important in applying that, those, those ideas, that knowledge uh, to, to our fishing. It can actually relieve some stress. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So let's get at this. So steelhead fishing, especially fly fishing for steelhead, can be an amazing journey. These fish spend most of their lives as, and pardon me, because I always tongue twist on some of these words as an adronomous strain of rainbows. Adronomous basically means that they are migratory in the sense that they live most of their lives in the lake. And um, Pacific Northwest steelhead, most of their lives out in the ocean before they run back into freshwater tributaries. Which means they can grow quite large without subjecting their energy budget to only survival categories. So what am I trying to say there? So as it is true in every other trout in the world, their biological system, when it comes to taking in food, hanging in the rivers and the creeks, they have an energy budget of sorts. And the very last thing that energy goes towards in a trout species is growth because the rest of it is survival. It is consuming. It is uh, uh, resting so that more energy doesn't get output than can be restored. That's why you find some of these fish hanging in the places that they do in the trout world. Not to get too, head of, too far ahead of myself here, but that's just a clue as to how the biology, if you will, of these fish dictates directly to our fishing for these critters, right? So... <clears throat> while in while it, while in the ease of Lake Erie per se compared to a river or creek, meaning if you could picture Lake Erie, although it has its waves, it has its currents. That's very very true. The Thalweg or the main current, if you it, in Lake Erie, is nothing like say Elk Creek when the when the water is is rising. They're not this this strenuous flow that these fish have to find cover under, in a more treacherous environment compared to Lake Erie where they can, in a sense, just hang out, find themselves 
above and below the light seam, above and below the skim seam. They can move around with a lot more ease. Um, a great freshwater example of this in another part of our state is the size of the holdover trout and potentially some wild trout in some of the upper portions of the um, Clarion River system. You find these fish that are pushing 24 to 30 inches because the gradient in the Clarion River is nothing like the gradient in the Little Juniata River. Now that creates a different kind of fish, and, and that's another story for another, another time, but um, needless to say, these fish spend somewhere around three to four years of their lives out in that lake before they ever come in. So they're out there, putting this together now, amassing weight and strength because they're not having to be overly concerned with just eating. They're able to expand that energy into growth quite a bit. So when they go from a seven inch smolt in the, in the fall, three to four years later, these fish run up in here and they're three, four, five, six, seven, eight pounds coming out of that lake. You know, the average fish is 16 to 18 inches at, at times. That's pretty substantial. But anybody who's tackled one of these fish or for those who haven't, let me give you some information here that will <laughs> cause your, uh, your good anxiety levels to go up. And that is these fish don't just come in here all fattened up. That's not what I'm saying. They come in here, if you will, hormonal and muscled up. And that, my friend, is one of the reasons that chasing these fish is so incredibly fun. Because you're not fighting a, a, a large carp that at a certain point, you know, it's really fun to fight a carp. But it's almost, or, or actually I've heard stories um, where you're fishing for walleye and there's this little fight. And then all of a sudden it's like you're reeling in a dead, giant dead sock or something like that. These fish generally don't give up too quickly. And, and that to me is incredibly uh, fun and joyful to pass on. So you have this fish that three or four years of its life is spent out before it ever comes into the tributaries. And they grow to be pretty large critters, full of power, right? Hence the fun. Then they have an overall lifespan of up to eight years. And that is if they don't get caught up in the crowds on, the, on lower elk. Just kidding. Um, there's a bottleneck when, when, when we have, like this year, we have had uh, a bottleneck of fish because... That bottleneck was really created by lack of rainfall. And a lot of those fish really got pounded by people. Um, and a lot of people put them back. A lot of people take them. And I'm not saying ethically one way or the other. I don't really have an opinion. Um, they're put there. You pay for them in one sense. If you like the taste of the fish, take your limit. Go home and have a great day. If you don't, thank you for putting them back. Because maybe I catch or a client catches that fish the next day or somebody else. So... Either of those things are completely cool, I think. Um, have at it, have fun. But another interesting thing about these fish among the trout world is they are, and here's one of these words that I have a hard time pronouncing, but I'm going to give it a whirl anyways. And it is, they are poikleotherms, which means that the cold temperature regulates these animals because technically they lack the ability to regulate their internal temperature. So with that in mind, when the temperature changes in the water, the fishing can change. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we deal a little bit more with these cold temperatures we have coming and winter tactics for these fish. But suffice it to say, knowing the science can help us in lowering our stress levels. I mentioned that earlier on. If you put a thermometer in your pocket and you check those temps and you're out and you say, okay, you start your J, let's say you start your day taking water temperatures and you find out that the water temperatures is mid forties or well below. Like we took a temperature of the day. The stream was so cold. I think I measured something like 35 degrees or it was freezing cold. Okay. I legitimately couldn't stand in the Creek for more than 25 minutes until I had to get out and take a break because I have some uh, toe issues. If you will, the rest of me stays warm. I'm still working on the on the science on how to keep those toes warm. I have some ideas. We're still testing, but nevertheless, it was cold and the fish didn't move. Not only did the fish not move in a sense, they're harder to catch, much harder to catch because 
like all trout, the winter months, those fish begin to lock up. And if you want more information on this, go check out our previous podcast from, from earlier on this season where we talked about winter tactics. And I talked a little bit about that proteothermic aspect of those fish and what that means to our fishing in general when it comes to freshwater trout, right? So the bite itself may be less recognizable because these fish slow down. The temperature slows them down. If you can think of it as the molasses effect, right? You can warm molasses up a little bit and get it moving around, but the colder it gets, the slower that stuff moves. It solidifies a little bit. Not the fish are solidifying. That's not what I'm saying. So we have this less responsive fish because of the water temperatures, but then as the water temperatures come up, the fish begin to become more active, more comfortable, if you will. So if you're out on the water and it's a cold day and you're just having a tough time getting fish to take, just take a deep breath. Realize that if you have a thermometer and the temperatures are that low, it's not necessarily you. But to the beginner, to the guy that, or to the girl that, that wants to jump into this and wants to go after it, here's some thoughts, right? Maybe not get up at three o'clock in the morning to go get that spot. Let people go in there and be discouraged and come back out. And I say that because we see that. Take your time getting up there. And once you get up there, maybe the, the temperature starts to rise outside. The sun comes up and starts to hit the surface of the water. And it'll warm some of that up and enough for those fish to begin to move around. And maybe, as we say, the bite comes on. In short, cold temperatures slow down the fish. So that's an important thing to understand. So it's also important as we segue into this, you know, when do the fish start to run? Well, that all depends on environmental stimuli, such as what strain of lake runs are we dealing with here? And at the end of the day, that's really what these are. I, I have to back up here a little bit and say this. So there are a few different strains. There are strains that come from... Uh, Michigan, there are strains that come from the Pacific Northwest. We in Pennsylvania here happen to see stocked a, a kind of a mix of species. We have a mutt of sorts, if you will, of a Pacific Northwest strains. And we happen to find, because of that, instinctively built into the genetics, if you will, that occurs from that um, that mix, we'll say, that, that mud of a fish, is that we have a, a little bit of a more generally fall time run. Not so much an early run. I would say the New York strains seem to run a lot earlier, maybe even late summer, depending on situations. But they're also higher up. Different water temperatures are affecting that as well. But then here's some other questions. You know, what not only what strain of lake run fish do we have here, and that's, that's what they are. They're a lake run rainbow trout. At the end of the day, if you walk away with anything, temperature regulates them and they are a lake run rainbow trout. And I'll say more on that rainbow trout thing here in just a moment, because there's something that I think a lot of us, if we're observant at all in the trout world, we'll notice there's a big difference between a rainbow trout and a brown trout. And it isn't just the spots. But I'll get to that in a minute. Um, here's a couple things. What's the water temperature of the lake? Do the tributaries have the levels needed by the fish? I think these are great questions. These are questions that the inquisitive angler should be asking. So I talked about the strain of fish, right? A little bit. I'm not going to get into the biology and all that, partially because I don't know it. And I don't think I need to know that depth, um, which... I'm interested in it, but I don't think it is going to help me much in the fishing world. So if any of you have any uh, data out there about that, man, send me a, a, an email with that or find me on social media because I would love to learn more about this stuff. Even though I just said it doesn't really affect my fishing that much. It, I love knowledge. I already said that. Not going to talk much about more of that um, from here on. So. So we have these, you know, these different strains, they run differently. Even the strain of fish, which is more of a manatees strain, I think that Ohio stocks, although they stock much less than what Pennsylvania stocks, they run in the spring, much like our regular rainbow trout. 
at least the run and the spawn all happen within the spring, where ours, uh, effectively, these critters are running in the fall. They do do some spawning, but I think a lot of the spawning in our systems happen in the spring. Like the actual attempting of depositing of eggs and the attempting of fertilizing of the eggs. Um, but I don't have the science on that, but it seems to be the, the case anyways. So there's this distinctive, out, there's this instinctive element that occurs in these fish uh, when it comes to the kind of fish that they are. Then the lake tank temperatures really, when they seem to move into the, se the low 70s and the mid 60s, this begins to move those fish into the tributary mouths and begins a little bit of this process. Now, lake, lake, this, this is in relation to the aforementioned cold blooded element of the fish's biology, right? I already talked about them being poliothermic critters. And this is important because it isn't just one thing that makes this all happen. Um, when we divide it up into, well, it's just this one thing, we miss these other elements. And if the other elements aren't always there or something interrupts them, well, then the, the run's different. It's affected. Not to mention, it's just important to look at all of it rather than just to point to one thing that makes everything happen. Rarely in life in general, let alone the natural world, is there one thing that affects the movement or, or, or mating or, or spawn of, of, of any kind of critter that's out there, let alone just in your and I's life. So, um, because of that cold temperature, that, that temperature change, it's not a magical thing. Now we know because that temperature change moves those fish. It's a lot like a buck and rut. You know, there's, all kinds of uh, ways that people view the rut. They view, they look at the, bi the, the, the um, barometric temperature in relationship to the amount of sunlight that's now hitting us now, to moon phases, and all these different things that a lot of people think affect movement in male deer in the fall. And I think there's some real clout behind all of that. But it isn't just one thing again. It's collectively. So how do you decipher if it's this, 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 or this? Well, you don't. In my opinion, you say, I think it all affects it. Figure out how that all works together. And it'll make you maybe a more effective hunter. Maybe you'll at least see more deer. And in the same sense, this is what we have here. We have a seasonal change in general, which affects the water. The water temperature then affects the fish. It, it In a sense, it, it doesn't trigger them, but it gets them more comfortably moving into those sources of water where they're going to, you know, at least try to spawn. And then once they make it to those, there's, there's another element that comes up and that is, well, is there enough water to, for those fish to comfortably run where they need to run? And how far do they run? I mean, that really depends on the fish. It depends on the fishery. It, it's, there's, there's cases where some of the fish that were stocked at the 20 mile, Five, uh, the 20 mile um, Route 5 bridge, many of those fish, when they were tagged, only came back to that spot year after year, which was just interesting to me. It's crazy. So, but that's a whole other thing I'm not going to talk about right now, which is this kind of um, chemical programming that may take place in these fish on where they're stocked, both specifically in the spot in the creek, but the creek itself. And there are articles about that if you want to go check it out. I may not talk about it here at all. So you have the the temperature change in the lake. You have um, the water levels, right? Now, here's something that a lot of people don't realize. The creeks in Lake Erie are ephemeral. And hydrologically speaking, that means that those creeks are the type of water systems that are almost 100% reliant on rainfall. No rain, no water in the tributaries, substantial enough to really help move those fish up. Now, nature being nature, it will always find a way. I've experienced it this year and other years, and so have many of you maybe even listening to this, they will find a way. But there becomes places that it becomes impassable for those fish where they would normally be 15, 20 miles upstream, but because of the lack of six or eight a foot of water, whatever the case may be, they can't make it that far. Or because they have to push so hard and use so much energy Resting times are longer, 
or there's even fatalities because these fish don't typically, according to one study that I'm still trying to, to find um, so that I can share it with you, the fish don't, a, a large majority of these fish don't eat when they're in the tributaries. And then most of us know, who are at least fly fishermen, there isn't a whole lot for them to eat in these tributaries, except for a few of them that do hold some critters. Um, I have seen on certain spots on elk that there are some uh, stoneflies and, and such, and of course there's tons of midges, but you're talking about uh, a biomass, a negative amount of biomass there for fish of this size to reproduce the energy that they're using. is is It's just not there in those creeks. You can ask any entomologist that's studied in those areas specifically that it lacks those very much, um, mainly because the substrate and the water levels, but a little bit of a different subject there. So we, we, we talked about the water temperature lake. We talked about the, 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 um, the water levels, but then there's this main element. I think the one that kind of puts it all together for us. And that is it's spawning season, right? There is something that is instinctively triggered, and there's a lot of speculation in the world of biology when it comes to things like this, right? Because nobody's ever talked to a trout. I mean, I'm sure some of us have talked to a trout, but we haven't had a discussion with a trout. It's been a monologue, a lot like me speaking and recording right now. There isn't a trout with a fedora on sitting at a barista waiting for every fisherman that's inquisitive to step up, buy him a cup of coffee and say, hey, I want to tell you about myself. That just doesn't happen. So there's speculation. And there's a lot of anthropomorphizing going on, too, where we take human attributes and ideas and we impose that into the world of science to try to understand. And some of that works out a little bit, but a lot of it still remains storytelling and speculation at best. But we can foresee that certainly this time of year, these fish run into those tributaries seemingly for one reason. Some of them to find their lady and to beat everybody else up in their process of trying to be the one dude that can be with the most ladies. To, do, to, to, to deposit the eggs and to fertilize the eggs. That's the process that kind of overarching dr dr drives this entire season, quote unquote, of steelhead fishing. And it happens when all these things come together. There isn't some mysterious element to this. I mean, maybe moon phase affects some things. I don't know. I can tell you barometric pressure does affect the fish. They have an air bladder that helps them stay afloat. And any kind of inside or outside pressure that comes on something that requires, uh, that, that has an air system built into it, well, it's going to be affected. I can't tell you exactly how that's affected, but I can tell you that it's part of it. So... When we see these things occurring in the tributaries, the tributaries are the, the level in those tributaries are vital information as to when we should go, where we should go, and in a sense, how we should go. Learning to find the correlation between the cubic feet per second um, information, the data that the USGS gauge systems give us, and there isn't enough up there, I'll be honest. Um, I would love to see one on 20 mile. I don't think there is one on 20 mile. Maybe that's something we can all talk about um, trying to help the state put in or, or something of that sort. Because 20 mile is one of the larger tributaries. And that tributary, even though it has more gradients than some of the others, may give us better data than the Brady Run or whatever it is, one that's attached to Elk Creek. I, I don't understand that one. But because there was one point that the gauge said zero but you could still go catch fish and there was a decent amount of water, not great, on Erie, on, on the, on the, um, the, 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 yeah, on Elk Creek. So there's a lot, I think, that goes into understanding the fish and the fisheries. And I think that's important to our overall fly fishing experience from, it's going to dictate, dictate to us the clothing that we wear, the tackle that we wear, the angle that we approach the fish, 
Did I say the tackle that we wear? Well, I guess. But the tackle that we approach those fish. You know, you may end up with long leaders. You may be able to practically stand over those fish. The truth of it is, the more the the, the person who's more successful is probably using more appropriate tackle or like I've experienced and probably many of you have, the guy that says he caught 70, he hooked up with 70 fish in a day. Well, hooking up in the mouth and hooking up to another body part are two different things. So hooking up and breaking off doesn't, in my opinion, in the sport of it doesn't count. If you can't show that it was in its mouth, hooking 50 fish or 60 fish in a day is not the same as legitimately connecting with a, a biting fish. So that's another little rant. I'll just leave at that amount. So I think the invested angler is, is somebody who, who seeks this kind of knowledge. Starting out in the world of steelhead fishing, become that vested angler. Become the one that looks at the organizations, private and, and, and corporate, that help our fisheries, specifically here, the steelhead fisheries. I mean, there's so many great things that go on out there. I mean, we have... Um, you know, fisherie.com, which is which is pretty darn amazing. We have the PA Steelhead Association. We have, uh, honestly, as a guide, I'm going to say this and it's okay, tons of guides that are knowledgeable. Some who have been fishing their entire lives, in a sense, on these tributaries. It doesn't mean that they necessarily have, you know, maybe secrets or something that you can't discover on your own. And maybe you're not the type of person to go out with a guide, and I respect that. This podcast is hopefully a help for folks like you as well. And to reiterate things to my clients that I have tried to cover while on the stream. There's a lot to be thankful for. There's a lot to appreciate. There's a lot to constantly be learning about these fish in the fisheries. And as a beginner or even somebody who's been in this a while, I hope that I've given you some good information on this episode. And I thank you again for joining me. And I will now shut up and let you get back to doing what you were doing before you hit play. Remember, keep your lines wet and your flies in the fish's mouth. And as a side note, remember, it's not about the destination. It's the journey that makes you. God bless.